boys and girls for another special edition of the michael deacon program ah yes welcome back welcome back we definitely do have a very special treat for you a very rare on-site interview i conducted with mr clyde lewis from ground zero very rare very special this was the first time i've actually conducted an on-site interview with anyone and sure enough it happened to be clyde lewis i couldn't have picked a better person to do an on-site interview with for my very first time. He's a great guy. I hope you enjoyed this interview. We covered a lot of topics. I do want to thank Clyde for conducting the interview with me, by the way. He didn't have to do it, and he didn't have to give me so much time, yet he did, and I respect him to death for it. Special shout out to Clyde Lewis and his producer, Ron, for putting this together. Much respect to you, and of course, all the great people that conducted Contact in the Desert. Now, without further ado, let's get to that interview. And keep in mind, the audio isn't the very best. I mean, this is the first time I actually had to use this strange device in my hand. It was a little awkward for me to do it that way. You know, we didn't have all the fancy equipment in the room. Matter of fact, we couldn't even get the room. But that's a whole nother story for a whole nother night. Now sit back and relax and enjoy this interview. See you soon. I'm here with Clyde Lewis at Contact in the Desert. It's pretty phenomenal that you're here, that I'm here. You know, big fan of yours, and um, you know, I've been following your career for a long time. And we have, you know, common interest in one Tracy Twyman, who at one time was your producer. Yes, she's been on my program a couple times, and you know, some of the last emails that I got from her, a little cryptid, a little troubling to me, and I have no idea what was going on. So, I would just like to know your opinion. What exactly do you think maybe happened or didn't happen? Well, to be honest, um, I don't really have a gag order on me about this, but uh, there's a lawsuit that I'm in the middle of right now that uh, apparently her husband is suing me because uh, he believes that I've been spreading rumors about her and him. And um, he also uh, has come after me for something he believes it's copyright infringement because we had uh, uh, a time where uh, there was internet uh, compilations that were on the uh, that were available and so they were exchanged by listeners and others uh, and he felt that it was copyright infringement and we did not get a cease and desist order we didn't get anything and so uh, what bothers me about this whole affair is, is that Forbes did a story about me and about the accusations that had been levied against me saying that I had been spreading rumors about that he was, uh, he was, he killed her and uh, I never ever would have done that. Um, in fact, uh, to set the record straight, I married them. I married them both. I married her and her husband. Uh, her first husband committed suicide. Uh, I actually eulogized him. And then two, three weeks later, she's marrying this guy, and uh, she was happy, and I was happy for her. She was a producer of mine. Um, and then uh, after there was a, a problem that took place uh, with the management of the radio station I worked for, and she left. She left without an explanation. And for a while there, we weren't in contact with each other. And uh, 
I had said to a friend of mine who knew her really well, I said, well, I need to get an explanation as to why she just left. And uh, finally, we came together and talked, and it was copacetic. Everything was good. Uh, But there was a time before her passing that she called me uh, one day to meet her in a park. And she looked really, really like she was troubled. And she was telling me, she says, I'm on to something here. I'm, I'm investigating something. I don't want to tell you what it is because I don't want you to worry about me. I'm investigating something, and I worry that people are, are uh, spying on me or tracking me. And while we were in the park, there was a woman that was sitting across from us on the bench, and she looked over and she said, you're following me. And the woman got up and left after she was called out. And in traces, I, I think it was a bad idea to come here to this park. And I said, well, okay. So there was a lot of paranoia there. Um, But there was no indication. She didn't tell me anything bad going on in her family life, uh, although there were a lot of other people that were saying things to me. And when I did the eulogy on my show, um, there were a number of people who appeared on the program that he's also suing um, because they were basically doing fair comment on how they felt about what was going on with her life. And, you know, when you're doing a radio show, fair comments, fair comment, you just don't say, now, wait a minute, you know, you have no evidence of this. But they knew her more than I did. Um, And they were saying that she was on to investigating a pedophile ring, that she went to the FBI, the FBI discredited it, and then she's dead. Um, And uh, I said on my show, though, I said, well, if there's an investigation to be had, I'll certainly be investigating it. So all I did is I called the Vancouver Police Department and I says, is the case with Tracy Twyman open or closed? I said, it's closed. I said, okay. And I just let it go. Uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want to generate any, uh, I didn't want to generate any ill will with the family. I didn't want to generate any ill will with anyone and saying things that I don't know about because I didn't. And now for some reason I'm being sued by her husband. And it just makes me feel a little on edge because I haven't had an opportunity to talk about it, and, I, and they don't want me to talk about it, but sometimes I feel like, and I'll just, I'll level with you, sometimes I feel like that I'm being harassed by him, and there's no reason for it. I mean, they, they actually fa- took the show that I did, and they analyzed it, a company did, everything, even the commercials that were played, everything, every bit of words that were spoken, not once did I say anything about him or anyone else being involved in her death, saying that she was murdered. I said the speculation was there that she was murdered. Um, and so that's as far as it goes. Yeah, those are some wild accusations on their part to be throwing at you, Clyde. And again, you yeah, know, I don't know you personally, but I've listened to you for so many years now. It seems out of character that, you know, these accusations would be even brought on your name. So Everybody has said that. And that's the thing is I wish I had the support of people like you and others because I, I tell them the story and they say that they remember me saying things like I don't want to harm the family with speculations and conspiracy theories that may not be true and uh, but somehow and and there are many other uh, talk show hosts that have said things I mean I've heard everything from you know she was having uh, communications with Baphomet on a Ouija board which she was she she wrote the book about that um, clock shavings. yeah clock shavings and uh, clock shavings and uh, and then the um, the idea that uh, you know Baphomet killed her, or that she was investigating a pedophile ring and they killed her, that she had an embrace, she had not an intimate relationship, but she had this communication relationship with Isaac Cappy. Uh, I didn't even know who Isaac Cappy was, and somebody told me well, she was uh, talking with Isaac Cappy, and I'm like going, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, Isaac Cappy was one of the many who came forward and accused a lot of Hollywood stars of being pedophiles. And, and so, and then he dies in Arizona, and then comes the conspiracy theory that she was investigating something in Arizona. And none of these things I really focused on. The dead man switch idea, that she left a, a, a video, and that was her dead man switch, saying that, you know, uh, and other people have come up to me and said, well, you know, Tracy said to me before she died, I didn't commi- I'm not gonna kill myself. And so you get all these people who I had no idea knew her, in fact, being as close to her as I was, I didn't really know her that well. And that's the thing that's most frustrating. If I would have known what was going on and I could have intervened, I probably would have. But just the idea that I feel more like an outsider than someone who would be in the thick of it, and yet I'm still getting a lawsuit given to me because I cared about her. 
That's the whole point. You care about somebody and they sue you and you're like, why bother? And, uh, and so that's pretty much my story. I, I have no other way. I mean, there was other t- I know there were other talk shows out there that had speculated about who may have you know, been involved with her murder. I know that there was, uh, we had Sloan Bella on the program. There was a psychic saying that she felt that something had happened, that she was murdered. Um, and then she, of course, was on the lawsuit too, but they dropped the charges against her because she was a psychic. But see, I just don't know why he continues to come after me because it's been shown that I have not said any of these things. I was not violating any copyright, anything, because, and I told the lawyer, I said, you know, there's no cease and desist, nothing. If I, if I would have known that there was copyright infringement or anything, she worked for me. And I figured as a, as a person who worked for me, I would probably have an ability to at least present some of her material in memory of her. But even when that happened, we decided against it because we just didn't want the problems. And so her life, well, basically after her death, her posthumous life, uh, has been filled with more chaos than her real life. And I feel like I'm in the middle of it. I just don't want to be in it anymore. In fact, it's very, it's depressed me. I, I've been in a lot of depression over it. And my wife has been, you know, also she knew Tracy. And um, In fact, she was supposed to do a show with us the day she uh, committed suicide. We want to talk about Midsommar. And uh, that was the movie that came out. We want to talk about the rituals of Midsommar and what she thought of that. But then, and, she, and we were supposed to have lunch with her a couple days before that. We didn't have lunch. And then I tried calling her, and then somebody had called me, and I didn't know who it was, said, we've lost Tracy. And I go, what does that mean? She says, well, she's dead. She hanged herself. And, and, and I'm like, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was unreal. It was just an unreal feeling. that I got a mystery caller telling me this, not the husband, not anybody else. And I even talked with her husband. I said, and he was crying. We had a good cry on the air together. And I said to him, I said, I will not do anything to harm the family. I will be very respectful. And I was. But this was three years ago, four years ago. And this lawsuit just comes from out of the blue. And, I'm, and they're trying to get me to remember or they want me to surrender what? My, my electronic stuff, everything, exchange, whatever. Yeah, who keeps three years after, you know, that sort of thing? They don't, especially... And, I was, and all it was was that I was just arranging shows. But there were a lot of other people who were more excited about preserving Tracy than I was because I just didn't know where to begin. I even wrote her eulogy. I wrote her obituary. So there was a lot of things that I did that, you know, now I just feel like that maybe I should have just backed off. To me, it seems like someone talked to her and put what, or not to her, to the husband, and put some information in his head which made him do this to you, in my opinion. Well, yeah, I mean, you think what you want. I, I just, uh, in fact, I told the lawyer, I said, you know, somebody that's this obsessed with bringing me down, I worry for my life. I mean, whether he did or he didn't or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just the idea of his actions now. Why is it so important for him to persecute me and harm me and harm my family that he's willing to do this? I mean, the court case doesn't happen until like next year. But the lawyers are calling me all the time, harassing me, telling me this, 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 and this. And I said, you know, this is harassment. And I said, I I don't appreciate it. And I said, I'm low-lying fruit, you know, because he thinks that I'm this multi-millionaire talk show host that he can get money out of. And I said, but there are plenty of other talk show hosts out there that she's been on shows with that would probably say more about her than I would, even derogatory things because of her practices with Baphomet and other things. And I... I just don't get it. I just don't. I think he's kind of myopic in the idea that it's me, and it's not me. I, I can honestly say that if there was something that I had done, and that I had to basically say, yeah, I'm sorry, um, go with what you are. I, I, but I know I didn't. I know that I have not done anything that somebody who cared about her wouldn't do. And it just is sad that this is how it ended. It's sad that, you know, someone who I cared about and loved as a person, the person that they loved is now turned on me, and I don't know why. Yeah, I could tell it was really troubling you during the time that all this initially happened, and still to this day, I know it's quite troubling for you to even talk about it, and we haven't even begun yet. Yeah, I mean, people have been asking me here at the conference uh, about it, and you're the only person I've opened up to because I trust you. Uh, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I haven't opened up to anybody about this. In fact, whenever they ask me, I go, not going to talk about it. Um, Probably for the best. Well, yeah, because you don't know who you're talking to, and you don't know what they'll say. Well, I talked to Clyde Lewis, and Clyde Lewis said this, and Clyde Lewis said this. And my response is, I really don't know. 
And that's and I'm not lying about that because I really don't know. Um, I don't know any of the activities that she may or may not have been active in or doing before she died. I just know that the the time I saw her before she died, she was in a lot of she was in a paranoid state. Yeah. Nervous and scared, worried about her life. That's and then it seemed like when yeah. I last emailed her, that was the mood I got. She yeah. seemed paranoid and worried about something. Yeah. Yeah. And never once did she say anything about her husband. And uh, although a lot of people were telling me, well, yeah, you know, things are whatever. And I, I have a colleague of mine that told me that she got a phone call saying something like that she wanted to move to California and all. And none of this stuff I knew. They were sharing it with me, and I just thought, well, this is a problem that she has to deal with. I can't intervene. I can't do it. And it's, you know, what's my, you know, what can I do? What's my power? Yeah. I mean, people are adults. You know, they can live their life the way they want to. As they will. Yeah. And, you know, I've had people right now in my life that are intervening with a lot of things that I'm dealing with with my health. And... Um, you know, I'm not dying or anything, but they don't want me to. That's why they're intervening. <laughs> so, yeah, you can't die yet. You got a lot of things you got to do. And uh, so, yeah, I'm glad I have people who care about me. But I swear, if I died or anything and my wife decided to do this to people who cared about me, I would never be. On the other side, I would probably haunt her and get angry. And I just, like I said, it's just sad that this divorce come to. One of the last shows I heard you do doing on Ground Zero, um, you were talking, I forget the gentleman's name, but you seem to be really worried about death and you seem kind of troubled about your own health and mortality. Um, these are all sort of rational sort of thoughts. And I, does it must, do you constantly think about that or? Well, yeah, let me confess I do. Um, well, you know, after you've had three cancers, you've had three cancer surgeries, and then you had blood clots, five of them hit your lung and you survive it. You're not vaccinated, are you? No. Okay, I'm not. good. I don't want you to be. No, I'm not. I, my doctor said not. Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. Good doctor. You know why he said it? Blood clots. That's right. He said, yeah, they cause blood clots and you don't want them. Um, my doctor is a good doctor. Uh, I love Dr. Jansen. I love you. I've always told him that. He's a big fan of my show, too, oh, nice. and so he looks after me really well. Um, right now he's going through a personal tragedy and my heart goes out to him. But, uh, yeah, my doctor cares about me. I got people who care about me. Uh, but the reason why I'm going into treatment, which is what I'm going to do. And you're not suicidal, just for the record. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Um, no, it, it, there, I turned 59 and, you know, there are not many big guys like me walking around at 59. And the, the, the weight that I gained was after my third cancer surgery because I was unable to walk, I was unable to move, I was unable to go to the gym, I neglected myself. And then COVID comes along. We all neglected ourselves during yes. COVID. I mean, we let our hair grow out, we let, you know, we let our bodies go, we didn't pick up our laundry. I mean, I'm describing a lot of people, I think. Um, and we just let ourselves go. And I, I started doing that and I said to my wife, I said, I think I need some cognitive behavioral therapy. I said, I don't know where to find it. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to go on antidepressants. I don't know how to deal with this. And so I was looking earnestly for a place I could go to for treatment. But then all of a sudden, there were a number of people who were interested in my welfare calling me and saying, we have some ideas for how you can help yourself. We want you to, you know, take a break. I mean, I've been doing this for 27 years without a break. Even uh, the sad part is that even when I had my third surgery, I know I just got stapled up. I, I was on... Uh, morphine and I was doing my shows oh wow the only thing kept me going was the morphine and uh you're like Michael Jackson but, <laughs> yeah I guess but uh then I collapsed one night on the air That's and sick. they ambulanced me to a hospital and uh it was funny because the HR person at the radio station I was working at says we're not going to have you work unless you get a doctor's release oh, yeah. so the doctor's they wouldn't sign a release. And they were mad at me because I even worked. But I thought, what am I doing? I'm sitting and I'm talking. How's that going to be hard on me? But I realized it was hard on me. It's a, it was a job. Well, yeah, you do. You, I know a lot of people out there that will listen to this. They're like probably thinking, how do you get tired? You're just sitting and talking. I do more than that. Yeah, but for those that don't know, there's a lot of, you waste so much energy. And you're, when I'm done, I'm just sitting there and I'm like drenched in sweat. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you know that my show is more than a show. It's, yeah. it's a production. Yes. And luckily I've been able to delegate some of the production to my staff. 
Uh, I used to wake up, write the show, do all the production pieces, the art production uh, sound montages that I do. I did all that. And then I had to do three to five hours of, of material. That can really weigh on you. And I did that for a good eight years. And then I get the syndication gigs. And I'm like, uh, yeah, okay, now what? And so I get a very good staff, a very competent staff. Uh, Ron Patton, who was publisher of Paranoia Magazine, he jumped on board. I was very grateful for him. He, he left San Diego and came and worked for him in Portland. And then I have uh, Wes Scottco, who I actually met on a train, a uh, crosstown train, and he told me that he was going to uh, video art school. And I said, well, I need a producer who can commit to working with me. It's not going to be very much money and commit. So he was working with me, and he realized, yes, there's not much money in it. He left to go do some other things, and I was really sad about it because I thought he had potential. But then, after so many years, he came back and he says, will you take me back? And I said, damn right, I'll take you back. I think you're very good. And he has become probably one of the best if not the most annoyingly best producers ever. I just, uh, what I mean by that is, is that he's such a professional that sometimes he gets annoyed when people aren't as professional. <laughs> that, can be, that can be a little bit like, ah, oh, you know. But he's great. I mean, he just, he knows his stuff. He, he uh, is very accurate and his production skills have really improved. His montages have just been amazing. And uh, I, can't, I, I can't complain. I have a great staff, and the show has been very good. Um, even our bad shows are good, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the beauty of what we do. Is, and, and, and I don't want to lose that. And so going into a, I don't know if it's, you'd call it a medical retirement, but it's a medical break for me. And I think and when I bring it up to a lot of people, they all say good, because they know how I am. They know that I don't, I don't stop. And this is going to drive me nuts. You know it is. I'm going to go absolutely crazy. You, you definitely do need a break. You've been at it for so long. Yeah. Um, you first started, I believe, around the 80s, correct? When you first 90s. got into the 90s, when you first... 95. 95, and it's been so long. I know you don't really go on many, like, hiatuses or anything. You don't... No, I have really not. I mean, the only real hiatus I went on, believe it or not, was uh, when I had my third cancer surgery. I was out for three weeks. And like I said, I was worried about the listeners. I was worried about the show. And I had a, actually a, a major player in the radio industry come visit me in the hospital. And he says, we're learning just how long it takes for people to stop listening to Ground Zero. It was it Mike Siegel that uh, went in the hospital? Huh? It w was it Mike Siegel who visited no, you? No. Oh, not that legend. Scott Mahalik. Oh, okay. That's uh, a joke, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, it was funny because I just did an interview with Mike Siegel. I like him. Oh, guy. heck yeah, he's great. Old um, school. Love that. Very old school. And uh, I, I had listened to him when he filled in for, when he replaced Art Bell. Right, right. And uh, he also knows another colleague of mine, Lars Larson. And so there was a moment where I'd say, well, one of these days I'm going to meet him. And we had a great conversation. I saw him at a UFO conference years ago. And I was in the middle of talking with him during the interview. He has this uncanny knack for sounding like a politician. He should be. He should be. But he sounds like a politician saying, we're going to get down to the bottom of the UFO thing. We're going to get down to and I, it just makes me smile that somebody has that much enthusiasm. Uh, he belongs back on the radio. He's doing this podcast now. He belongs back broadcasting. And so I'm happy to hear that he's doing it. I really am. Absolutely. And why did you even get involved in broadcasting? What was it that, you know, what was the catalyst for you that made you want to jump into this? Uh, it goes back to, I had a friend of mine who was a guitar player in a rock band, and he started doing a radio show called Tradio. Radio. Yeah, it was a show where it was kind of like eBay for the radio. It was uh, before eBay even existed. You go on the air and you say, if you got something you want to sell, go on the air and sell it. So it gave people the opportunity to sell. The way you made money, though, is if people wanted to buy ads to sell their material long term. That's how he made his money. He charged like $10 a, 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 you know, just $10, whatever. It's back in the old days of radio. And what he did is he invited me to join him at this radio station, KBBX, Utah's Golden Gospel Giant. So all I did is I would do reel-to-reels of preachers, you know, doing their sermons. And then eventually I worked my way up to uh, working uh, uh, an overnight show at K-Light. And the way I got that over overnight show is I saw a beautiful woman. I was doing construction at the time. I saw this beautiful woman walking into the building, and I followed her. I was so compelled to meet her. And I said to her, I said, so how does one get to go out with you? And she said, I only go out with radio DJs. And I said, well, I used to work in radio. 
And uh, she said, well, you don't work in radio now. And I said, well, how can I get back into radio? And she says, well, first you got to send in a resume. You got to send in an air check. And so what I did is I said, okay, I'll send in a resume. And I said, hand me a piece of paper. So she handed me one of those yellow pad pieces of paper. For some reason, there was a basket of crayons. I did the whole resume in crayon right in front of her. I said, can you hand this to your program director? Two days later, I get a phone call. He says, I want to meet this idiot. This was says, I want to meet the idiot that did his resume in crayon, because you're a weirdo. And I said, yeah, sure. So I met him. And I didn't give him an air check, but he had me go back in another room. I did a few commercials, read a few commercials, read a few things, and he said, okay, I'm hiring you. But he said to me, he says, how much do you think you're going to be making? I said, I want to make $1,000 a month. And he said to me, he said, uh, he said, look, can I say, okay. He says, look, you little shit, he says to me. He says, you're going to make minimum wage. And he says, there are two things that are going to be happening to you in your radio. One, you'll always get laid, and two, you'll always have something to eat. And sure enough, when I was young and in the business, you always got laid and you always got something to eat, or you got two for one at the raceway, or two for one hamburgers at McDonald's. So you never really read that's how it worked. So you were doing the money thing, but you were also getting, you know, perks and dividends in the process. But it just, I mean, the guy uh, that interviewed me that was the program director was Sean Mulhern, and he was the voice of the Green Bay Packers. So that was my first uh, wow. real program director, was this guy who was a seasoned, grouchy old announcer, you know, kind of like Harry Carey, you know, who was voicing the, uh, the Green Bay Packers. He went back and worked the Green Bay Packers after that. But uh, then I went from Light Hits, Less Talk to uh, Classic Rock, did Classic Rock uh, stuff. And then um, I had a news colleague of mine that was doing a talk show on a little AM called KCNR. He says he couldn't do it anymore. He says, I'm handing the show over to you. What do you want to do? And I says, I have no clue. So one day I went into the studio. I spent the whole day and whole night in the studio to come up with Ground Zero and uh, came up with the theme song, came up with the, you know, the music and everything. And, and I went out, the first show I did was, uh, is Paul McCartney dead? Mm-hmm. Playing Beatles records backwards. And then I found out that there was a guy that actually played stuff backwards, David John Oates. So he came on and talked with me. And then we kept getting all the weird guests on, you know, people having, you know, whatever. I found there was a guy by the name of Art Bell who was doing the same thing I was. And I'm going, okay. But what was really cool is that we were multimedia at the time. We found the computer and the internet so fascinating that we were the first radio station to broadcast my Ground Zero show on the internet, followed by Art Bell. So Art Bell and I were on the internet, probably one of the first paranormal talk shows on the internet. And, uh, and Art got a call from China, and he wondered why he was getting calls from China. It's because he, they were listening on KCNR. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Small world, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, eventually, uh, Art, when he came back out of retirement, uh, he called me and he wanted a, a major affiliate. And KXL was a major affiliate. And I used to do five hours at Ground Zero. And he asked me, he says, could you please surrender, you know, two of your hours for me? Oh, wow. And I said, sure. And we were on the phone and he was doing his, uh, you know, before um, Heather Wade was on there. He, uh, he was doing the show. And then, of course... His th- he felt his family was being threatened, and he pulled out, and then, of course, he passed away. Um, but, yeah, it, it, was, it was just gone full circle, because uh, I, I, I wrote the Chupacabra song, and it was on Art Bell for a long time being played, and then I don't think anybody really knew who I was, but I wrote the Chupacabra song, and they played it, and now I play it on my show. It just reminds me of how, how far I've gone, you know, from being some guy who really wanted to make it to some guy who's made it. But still, I feel like I have to make it even more, you know, because I've been for that long. Absolutely, absolutely. And how do you handle the sort of criticism that you receive? It's not, many, it's not too many, but there are some, there's some criticism that is, gets lobbied your way. And Well, most of the attacks on me are basically on my weight. Um, they, you know, they can't find anything to pin on me, so they say, you're fat and whatever, and, and I just think, yeah, okay, I, I kind of own it myself, though, and, and I'm going to take care of it, so I'm fine. Um, it's just, you know, I can tell you it doesn't hurt, but it does, because I'm thinking that gets in the way of my, in, you know, my people taking me seriously. Um, I think a lot of people do take me seriously, and I find, even here, that a lot of people love me, and it's one of the things that you really don't hear. You know, you don't hear that from people. You don't hear love. 
they don't really love a talk show host. They don't really, and I get that. And I and I have never, in my experience in radio, I've ever had that outpouring of love and support. And so it's a unique thing to have in my regard. So the criticisms, they used to really get under my skin. I used to creatively find ways to demean people who come after me. But I got tired of that after a while. Um, I came up with really good put downs and insults I could throw back at them. And sometimes I do, depending on. But, it, you know, it's funny. There are people who do that sometimes. And uh, I win them over. I throw something back at me. They throw something back at me. And then I write them and I say, you know, you got me a bad day. I haven't had my coffee yet, so I snapped at you. I hope you don't mind that. And they understand that. They understand that, you know, I can, I'm just like any other guy who has a, sh you know, shitty day and, and, you know, I can be really crabby. And I, I find that interesting, too, because most of the time they'd write you off and say, you know, you're a son of a bitch. What the hell? But no, they, I don't know. It's almost like I'm a friend of theirs. You know, you, you got friends sometimes will snap at you or, you know, say I'm having a crappy day or they'll yell at you and say, what got into your, you know, whatever. They do that with me, too, and I think they understand that overall I'm a good guy and I'm not malicious. I can be, but it's, it fades away. And so I just find that the, the relationship I have with my listeners is being unique. The way I see it has always been crowds are won and lost and won again. Yeah. Yeah, uh, especially now. I can say something that would rub somebody the wrong ways. I'm never listening to you again. And they've done that before. But I know they're listening. Um, and, you know, people also come to my defense sometimes and say, don't let the screen door hit you in the ass. But I, I just know, excuse me, that we live in these times now where if you say something that people don't agree with, they don't debate you. They walk away from you. And I find that unfortunate because I just think that we're not going to get anything done unless we discuss it, even if we're, we don't agree with somebody. But everybody has this emotional... Uh, attachment to their opinions and just because you have an emotional attack, uh, uh, emotional uh, attachment to your opinion doesn't mean it's true right, right. And, and that's the problem is that don't get so emotionally atta attached to your opinions because they could change um, the truth changes now it used to not be that way but it does change now and, and we learned that with COVID-19 you know we learned that with all these other things that are happening in our lives that the truth of the moment is not necessarily the truth that lasts Right. And are there any conspiracy theories or topics that are that you just consider off limit and you can't really talk about on your show? Off limits. Um, not really. Um, it's pretty much fair. I think there are some that are uh, that have been beaten to death sure. that I don't talk about as much. Uh, but I always end up talking about them. Like I always say, this is my last Kennedy assassination show. And then I end up doing a Kennedy assassination show. Or this is my last D.B. Cooper show, and I end up doing it because I have an a, a interest in D.B. Cooper because someone who I worked with when I worked at KBBX and worked at that at radio station, a guy by the name of Wolfgang Gossett, apparently is a suspect. So I have a, I, I have a, a, a connection to the D.B. Cooper. And everybody's like sending me all this D.B. Cooper stuff. They found D.B. Cooper. They found, and you know what I say to them? I don't care. If it's Wolfgang Gossett, I care. If it's somebody else, I don't care. I want my friend to be D.B. Cooper. I want to be the guy who learned from D.B. Cooper. I want to be that guy. You know, wouldn't that be cool, though? You know, because, be cool. because he taught me everything he knows. I mean, he was an Antioch priest who did a show like mine back in the day. And I used to watch him, and I used to think, I wish I could do a show like yours. So in reality, if he is D.B. Cooper, or if he was D.B. Cooper, I learned from D.B. Cooper. And that makes it even cooler. Clyde Lewis, I mean, and there was actually a comic book that came out. Uh, a while ago, where there was a, a character that had my hair, had the same hair as me, same little half beard like me, and uh, he was uh, he was a man in black, and he was based on me as a character. And when they asked the other men in black, asked who trained you, they said D.B. Cooper. I said, did you know that I have a relationship with D.B. Cooper? They said, no, we didn't know that. And I said, yeah, or a guy who says he's D.B. Cooper. So yeah, th those are topics that I think. Bigfoot, too, is another one. I, I, I love Bigfoot. I saw a Bigfoot. You saw Bigfoot? Oh, yeah, I saw Bigfoot. Want me to talk about Bigfoot? Sure. <laughs> um, I was at a place called East City Ranch. It's run by John, uh, James Gilliland, and uh, it's out there in, uh, uh, near uh, you know, uh, Mount Adams uh, in Trout Lake area. It's in, uh, I think, Klickitat County or Skamania County, which is well-known for their Bigfoot sightings. 
Um, I never thought that I would see Bigfoot. And, I, and, and to this day, I'm just still wondering what I saw. But we were sitting in an informal interview like this. I was just getting out of bed. I was drinking my coffee, a little grouchy, you know, like I am in the morning. And, and we we're all talking about how we're going to pack up and leave and all this. And this is probably from here to that corner. There was a little corridor area where they have the washing, you know, the washing machines and stuff for the guests. And I looked out of the corner of my eye, and there was a guy standing there eating apples. There was an orchard at the end of the door, and he was eating apples. And I only remember seeing him, noticing his muscles. He had these huge muscles, and he had hair that looked like Robert Plant's hair, you know, from Led Zeppelin. And that's what I remember seeing him. And, and I was about to motion to him to say, hey, come on in and join our conversation. You know, just come on, hang out. And when I did, when I looked up directly at him, and I was about ready to say, come in, he gave me this look, and his face was flat. It was like, you know, when a kid pushes his face up to a window, or, you know, when somebody puts a nylon stocking over their face, right. it looked just like that. Wow. And I realized that's not human. Something about that is not human. And so this is how I reacted. I went, Bigfoot. I said it just like that, Bigfoot. I had it said it out loud. And then I go, no, 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 Bigfoot. And everybody in the room goes, what? And I go, yeah, look. And they looked, and there he was. He ran away, and the guys were chasing after him. But what was funny is I wanted to see if there were any, like, big feet or big footprints. This, whatever it was, landed on the balls of its feet and then leapt or leaped uh, so far that he left a big imprint of a foot. And they thought it was a juvenile Bigfoot. And I said, I, he was probably like seven feet or six feet tall. But then when I went back to East City, I noticed that the trees were a lot taller than that. So we're looking at something that was about eight feet tall. And like out of the corner of your eye, you're seeing a muscular guy that has Robert Plant hair. And the minute he looks straight at you, it's nothing like what you see in the Gimlin film, Patterson Gimlin film. It's not some guy just strolling by. You know you're seeing something that doesn't that doesn't look like it belongs. It's like a cartoon or something that doesn't belong. That's pretty wild. Yeah. I didn't know you had uh, experienced a Bigfoot before. Yeah, I, but the thing about it is, unless you have photos or it doesn't exist, you know, they, they always tell you that. So I figured that Bigfoot's like a fish story. You know, you can tell the story, but what, the reason why I like sharing it is because it, 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 didn't, it didn't happen the way I thought it would happen. It did, I mean, if you have a Bigfoot experience, you see it walking around, walking across the road right, or right. out of the corner of your eye, you're looking at a tree and it, something could be a black bear could be standing there and you're thinking it's Bigfoot. But no, I saw something that just didn't look right. It didn't look human enough. I mean, it did out of the corner of my eye, but when I looked directly at it, I realized I'm looking at something that isn't you know, human. human, right. And uh, I'm still trying to figure out, I mean, because it looked like a wrestler. It, it had the muscles. Like and it an had, 80s pro wrestler. Yeah. Yeah, it looked like an 80s pro wrestler. I was looking for the bikini briefs or whatever, but no, it was, it was just straight. And I realized that the, the tan that I was looking at was hair. He had hair all over, but the muscular, musculature and, and the long hair, the long curly hair from the head. But then, like... I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of a gibbon. Yes. Kind of looked like a gibbon face. Wow. And it was really bizarre. I like those monkeys, by the way, the gibbon. I, I love the gibbon. Yeah, yeah. They're great. Yeah, they got great personalities, unlike the baboons. Yeah, or the... Yeah, there's got to be a reason why baboons have red butts. They're just, <laughs> they're just angry all the time. Very true. Good observation there. And, <laughs> and Clyde, I mean, we're here at Contact in the Desert, and obviously you believe, or you want to believe, yeah. Have you ever had any sightings yourself? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. plenty. Yeah, I mean, go to East City. You see up to nine or ten a night. If you, you should go up there. I mean, if you get over to the Northwest, go out to James Gillen's Ranch. It has the lookout areas, and you can see these UFOs that come and go all the time. Uh, that's one of the places I saw some UFOs. I, I took a picture of one once that I didn't know what it was. But I have a story about when I was a child... Um, it was back probably in the late 60s. Sirens on, on uh, fire engines, ambulances, and police cars all sounded the same. They sound like the way sirens on, on uh, fire trucks sound, the old sirens. But then the whoop-whoop sirens came out. And there was an accident, I guess, that happened. The whoop-whoop sirens were going on. And I ran into the house, my father said, scared to death, saying the aliens are landing. And my father didn't know why I would say that, because I was really young. I was like four or five years old saying the aliens were landing. So for some reason, I knew of the aliens when I was a kid. But what really, what really inspired me to do Ground Zero was the fact that when I lived in this place called Kearns, Utah, 
It was a place called Blackie's Barbershop, and all the men would get together and talk conspiracy theories. And they would talk about Bigfoot, and they'd talk about JFK, and they'd talk about Nixon, and they'd talk about all this. And I always was fascinated by what they talked about. And then when I got older, I figured, you know, I want to go back and see if all these things are true. And that's what I did the show. It was basically barbershop talk. That's what it is, with a little bit of more. So when you're thinking about the, the roots of Ground Zero, it starts at the barbershop. And that's how it started. I like that very much. And we're almost close to the end here. And, you know, I did want to talk to you about the Zimbabwe case back in 1994. Yeah. A fascinating story. You know, more than 60 school children saw it. A, uh, it ranged from the ages of like 6 to 12, I believe. Right. And, you know, it's one of those cases that got me into the subject. When people ask me what's the most compelling, my subject. right? It's my favorite UFO story, the Zimbabwe story. Same here, because again, when I was a little boy, I hated reading, but I loved reading or seeing books about Bigfoot and ghosts, and there was a lot of books like that. And that's what first got me to want to read anything. And that Zimbabwe case was the catalyst for me to get even deeper with the subject. The thing about the Zimbabwe case that I really like is it's unimpeachable. Children. Yes. Okay. Children don't lie. Children don't lie. They tell the truth. And when you have a group of children all telling the same story, and I happen to interview uh, two of the girls. Yes. One lives in Seattle now, and I think another one lives in England. I felt honored to be interviewing them because I told them that that case was probably one of my favorite cases, and I was so into it. And uh, it's the most overlooked case, I think. I think there needs to be more stories about that. I think there should be long, I mean, they do all these long documentaries about a lot of things we really don't care about, or they, like, serial killers. But I think if they were to do a, a documentary, a really serious documentary with the kids, because I know they have records of the kids talking, but also bring the kids back. Where are they now? What do they think? Because a lot of the kids said they saw the end of the world in the eyes of this alien. And they saw a lot of other things, too. But it's just the idea that, okay, here you are some 20, 30 years later. How do you feel now about what you saw? Do you really, do you still think that you saw this, this character coming out of a flying saucer? And I know that uh, there was actually a school, other school there, that prior to that event, they were seeing something. So there was another school that saw some sort of uh, craft in the sky, but it just happened to land at this school. And uh, yeah, it's... Uh, if there was ever a, a time or anything I could get involved with uh, talking about this subject, it, like you, it's probably one of my favorite stories, and it's because kids are unimpeachable. You cannot question or at least, you know, say, how do they get all these kids together to say the same thing? You know, they might take a lot of time to do that, but no, they, obviously, you look in the eyes of those children and they saw something. They saw something. For sure, yeah, and that's yeah. one I always say, I get asked, what's the most compelling one? And I refer to that case all the time. And furthermore, it goes by the name of Azare, oh. and he's from South Africa, and he wanted to know what you thought of the Greys and just their nature and what, he's asking me, what does he think they are? Well, it's evolved over time um, because, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, something like this is very unbelievable. I often wondered if it was you know, when people were abducted or at least they met them, it's our brain basically blocking out a hideous image and replacing it with something sylph-like, something baby-like. But now I'm beginning to think after talking with people like Avi Loeb, a chair at Harvard, um, talking with other people who uh, I respect in the UFO community, I think what we're dealing with here is synthetic technology that whoever these advanced civilizations are, they've created something that looked anthropomorphic because they realized that we would respond to something anthropomorphic. I think we anthropomorphize a lot of things about the alien encounters, even though a lot of it may not be. Being anthropocentric about everything is, uh, I think, going to destroy our idealism regarding aliens. I mean, if it doesn't look like something from Star Trek, we're not going to care about it. If it, come down, if it comes down looking like an arachnid or a lobster, we'll be terrified of it. Or we may go grab the butter sauce and the, and the bibs thinking, oh, we're going to bring them to dinner. But, um, yeah, I think that these 
anthropomorphic beings, greys, are probably, if not actually um, synthetic intelligence. Because they don't have any genitalia, they don't have anything to reproduce with, so they probably reproduce electronically. Many people ask them the question, I ask a lot of abductees, what do these aliens smell like? Because think about it, when you meet someone and you're with them for a long period of time, they have a certain smell about them. Right. So if you're in close proximity to an alien, you gotta know what an alien smells like. The answer I always get is, it smell, they smell like urine, or they smell like sulfur. And I figure the reason why they do is because they expel their waste out their skins, you know, like photosynthesis. So rather than having, you know, it's a machine, but it produces, you know, it, it produces organic uh, methane, it produces organic uh, smells and things of that nature because they eat differently. They absorb nutrients around them and that's how these machines work. Um, but yeah, synthetic intelligence probably been visiting the planet for billions of years, and uh, it's, it's, it just stands to reason because we send out, you know, probes and robots and things of that. Our robots are a little bit more clunkier than theirs, but you know, we're not as advanced, but we're getting there, and eventually we'll be able to create anthropomorphic beings that can go into deep space and do this. Which is brings up another question as to whether or not maybe. 500 years into the future, we've created these anthropomorphic synthetic intelligent creatures that have gone back in time. They're watching us because there's an event that takes place within 100 years of our timeline, and uh, they want to see how we are, or they want to intervene, maybe even to avoid that situation, or maybe they just want to watch and uh, historical, that's kind of a, a sympathetic view of his history, coming back and watching us and, and exploring the time Timelines that could be uh, there. We have ultra terrestrials right, right. rather than extraterrestrials, but we always have this history though of extraterrestrial beings coming down and teaching us and giving us information, creating our spirituality. That's why we pray to heaven because whatever is out there that created us is supposedly up in the sky, which means that God is an extraterrestrial. Not an alien, but he's an extraterrestrial, or she's an extraterrestrial. There's a power out there that's very extraterrestrial that influences us. That's why they're really getting into things like uh, quantum immortality and all this. And uh, it's just a fascinating, just a fascinating thing to get into. There's so many different roads that lead to the idea that we're we're constant. And it's hard to even, I think, fathom the idea that we're never going to go away. We'll change. Like a, like a butterfly, you know, a, a caterpillar changes into a butterfly, they have the chrysalis and they become, you know, what are we going to become when, when we die? What are we going to be? I mean, it's like there's this broadcast, right? And it's coming from one source. And that broadcast, there's one that's you. You are the radio and the television that's picking up that signal. But when your body parts fall apart, that's gone. But the signal that is you still exists. And it's probably going to go somewhere else, and it's going to activate in something or someone else, and you'll live again. You won't remember the existence that you had before. Maybe you will. A lot of people do. But uh, it's still the constant, and it's hard for us to contemplate the constant. So, I like that. I was not expecting all of that, but that was perfect. And furthermore, um, Clyde, you know, on my show, I like talking about end times a lot. It's kind of the central theme and, you know, eventually, some say the sun will take us out eventually. Yeah. And you have people like Elon Musk and other multi-billionaires out there that want to colonize another planet and all this sort of jazz. Um, I always ask a lot of guests, and I, I say, if we had sort of like a time machine to take us to, let's say, that end point where we eventually have to jump from Earth to another planet, what do you want? to experience that yourself and I always say hell yes because I'm a little cynical and I would love to see the earth being destroyed and me being far away from the earth that's being destroyed so I could see the light show that sounds kind of insane but I mean I'm not that normal but I would just love to hear your take would you want to see that or would you be a little scared to see something like that happen do you want to watch your house burn down I mean sometimes I would like to I mean really 
Uh, well, why not? It, it'd be fun. See, for me, it would be if I lived in a childhood home and grew up, I wouldn't want to see my house burn down. Well, that's or be bulldozed. A, right. That, that's a whole other thing. And the earth is so beautiful. I mean, I mean, to us, it's home. And it, to a Martian, Mars is home. But then again, are we the Martians? That's another thing. Is that why we're so fascinated by Mars is because it attracts us for some reason. It's like Superman looking for kryptonite. We're looking for our home. Yeah. You look at all of the... Uh, the, the idea is that we could be Martians. I was talking with Avi Loeb about that uh, yesterday. And, uh, you know, I thought to myself, well, that would be then the literal fall of mankind, wouldn't it? The idea that the Garden of Eden was on Mars. But the Hebrew word for man is Adon, man of red clay. So the red clay that God created, the golem, was on Mars. And then we had to leave Mars because Mars was destroyed. And we had to construct our own Earth in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We had to cons- uh, do it. And then the only thing missing was light. And light is the source for everything, right? You can't see without it. Frequencies are what make everything together. It holds everything together. Light and electricity, that's what holds us together. And uh, I would say the magnetism and the electricity and all these major powers are the powers of God. And in every one of us, we have an electrical charge that keeps us going. And something called the little you. Yeah, we have that beacon. That's yeah, where the beacon that's in us that's our little you. You can call it the light of Christ. You can call it the Holy Spirit. You can call it whatever. But we all have it. Conscience. And that's one of the things that a lot of the scientists now are trying to develop. Panpsychism. Where they're trying to develop an attitude towards everything has a consciousness. They used to laugh at that, but now they're thinking that maybe everything does. The plants have a consciousness. This chair we're sitting on has a consciousness because someone with a consciousness created these things. We are creators just like our God is a creator. We are developers just like the Grand Order developers are developers, G-O-D, Grand Order developers. So um, it's, it's in our blood. It's in our nature to be like that which created us. And so when people say, well, why are we creating robots? I don't know, why did God create us? Maybe we're these organic, remarkable robots that, you know, at first we were all mechanical clinking tin men, but then we got organic flesh and we were able to feel things. We get placed in this electronic atmosphere that creates this illusion of living in a, in a world that, you know, and then when we dream, it's all part of the same process that we're in another matrix going through the process there that's a training ground for when we get back into the conscious world. It's, it's a fascinating, this life is fascinating if you only right. get the chance to be. And I, I think a lot of people in their humdrum lives believe that it's always the six o'clock news and uh, you know, uh, bachelorette or whatever and then go to bed. But no, if you find the time in your life to have a, an interest in life, an interest in what the consciousness is telling you, I think that uh, we'll find ourselves in a, in a different way of thinking. So in other words, you wouldn't want to take that chance, but as you said, you know, life is beautiful. You know, you're going to see the beginning of a, a new sort of change in the world, you know, a new beginning. Um, part of me would be terrified, but a part of me would want to see something well, come. See how it ends. I think everybody wants to see how it ends, uh, except for those who want to off themselves. but. I think everybody wants to see how it, I mean, that's how I feel. I want to see how it happens, yeah, what's going I'm on. Curious. This, uh, I'm so curious, like same. you are. I am so interested in how this happens, but I also have a, a, a big fondness for retrocausality, right? So I think it's already happened. And the reason why we're acting the way we're acting is because we're reacting to it before it happens. We, we sense it happening before it happens. So, so whatever it is, whether it's the second coming or an alien invasion or a nuclear blast or whatever, we've already prepared it. It's like uh, I was talking one of my, uh, in one of my uh, uh, seminars, one of my lectures. I learned about retrocausality in a strange way. I was interviewing Orrin Hatch, who's the head of the 9-11 committee. Oh, right, right. And I said to him, I said, was it worth our relationship with Osama bin Laden because, of course, Osama bin Laden was a very intricate part of bringing down Russia in the, in the Afghan war. Yes. And I said to him, I said, uh, so communism fell in the late 80s because of Osama bin Laden being our friend and helping us to bring down Russia. And he goes, yes. And I said, then you go ahead to 2001, 
that same man who helped us bring down communism was involved with killing 3,000 people that day in New York. And he goes, yes. I says, so were these people dying in 2000 worth it to bring down communism in 1989? He said, they never thought of it that way. I says, well, they did. They sacrificed their lives for communism to bring it down in Russia. And we didn't even know until 2000. But 89, it came down to 2000. We had a guy who killed 3,000 people that were part of that. And I said, that's retrocausality. That big event in New York was the big event that everybody knew was coming, that was going to change the way we live in this country, and it has. I mean, kids today know nothing about life before 9-11, and they don't know how free we felt and how, you know... In fact, there are kids today that watch Stranger Things, the, the TV show, yes. and they can't relate to the idea that when we were kids, we were able to ride our bicycles at 10 o'clock at night home. As long as we were home by 10, everything was cool. Right, but they can't relate to that because none of them have that life now. Because life is pretty scary now, post 9/11, and I think it was meant to be. And I think the more trauma we experience, when the next trauma is the anticipation, I think of nuclear war or at least a limited nuclear war. I don't think a lot of people don't know that Ukraine has already gone nuclear. They uh, they shipped uh, depleted uranium missiles. Uh, England did to uh, Ukraine, and Russia flew over bombed a stockpile, sending a plume of radioactive debris into the sky over Poland. That's a nuclear war. Right. Technically. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, people are waiting for the big mushroom cloud to go up. There was a mushroom cloud. There were two of them went up. But I don't think they know just how radioactive material was going up in the sky and it's probably going to give cancers and stillbirths and everything to people in Poland. So, I mean... I think we wait for things to happen the way Hollywood's told us. And when they don't happen that way, we don't believe it. Right, right. It's kind of like my Bigfoot experience. You know, I, you know everybody's used to you know, seeing some blurry thing on a, on a YouTube channel. And I didn't know what I was in the middle of it until I realized it. And I don't think people realize that they're in the middle of a civil war or they're in the middle of a culture war or they're in the middle of something. Um, when I was in South America, we didn't even know sometimes we were in the middle of a riot. Here you are in the middle of a crowd of people, and you're thinking, why is there so many people in one spot? And then all of a sudden you start hearing bombs go off, and you hear people screaming at each other, and you realize, damn, I'm in a riot. i got to get out of here. I don't think people realize what they're in the middle of it until somebody actually points it out to them. I don't think people see UFOs unless somebody actually points it out to them, because they're used to what Hollywood tells them is the version of this. And if it doesn't look Hollywood enough for them, they'll say, ah, I don't believe it. Right. Because we respond to hyper-reality and symbolism. We, we, our realities are so boring now that something hyper-real is far more preferable to what is real. And real is mediocrity. Real is incompetence. Real is un, un, unsettling. But hyper-real is entertaining, stimulating, and better than real life. And I think people prefer that over life. And one last question, Clyde, and I do thank you for being here and sharing your time with us. Um, I wanted to ask you about let's say Elon Musk, do you think that's someone that we should trust enough that we actually implant a chip for our brains? Do you think we should trust someone like that that has such ties to other people like Bill Gates? Also, they were friends that, uh, you know, they, they claim they weren't, they had nothing to do with each other, but he was also, you know, friends with uh, Bill Gates, he, uh, we're going to be friends with uh, Jeffrey Epstein as well, amongst others. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know Elon Musk, so I don't know if I can trust him or not trust him, but I'll tell you this. You know, here's a guy that tells us that tinkering around with AI is like opening up a box with a demon in it. He said it's like playing with a demon. So what does he do? He says, oh, okay, well, yeah, playing with a demon, but it's okay if you take a chip and put it in your body and be a part of the demon. Um, but it's like I say, like I say in all the presentations I gave today, if you're a Star Trek, the next generation fan, think of this. They had Data. Data was this character that was a robot, sympathetic robot, sympathetic AI, um, helping the crew, going out of his way to be more human. He was kind of like a reverse Pinocchio story. Yeah. And, but then there was something worse out there. The biggest enemy the, the uh, Federation faced wasn't the Klingons, wasn't the Romulans, it was the Borg. Now why? Because the Borg wanted to make everybody connect to the hive mind and become robots themselves. 
the, the preference is to have robots work for us, not the machines making us work for them. And if the machines are trying to assimilate us, that's not what we want. And even science fiction teaches us, we don't want to be part of a collective of machines. Tapping into Neuralink, tapping into the internet of bodies, tapping into the smart cities, tapping in, that's one way that we're going to give over our freedom. We'll be enslaved by the machines, and we already are. I mean, when you have your cell phone, that's a controller. I mean, look, I'm not going to tell anybody, hey, ditch your cell phones, because they're conveniences. But it's like I asked somebody in, in, one of my, uh, in one of my groups, I said to them, I said, do you know your wife's phone number? A lot of them said no. I don't know my wife's phone number. All I know is Siri, yeah, call my wife. You know? yeah. All I know is you know, dial this number. I don't have it memorized anymore. Sure, I have my social security number memorized because I have to give it all the time. Sure, there are other numbers that you memorize, like your home phone when you're a kid, right? Yeah. But just the idea of mesmer- uh, memorizing all these numbers of your friends and your contacts. That's archaic. Yeah, yeah it's old, and you don't do it. But see, this is the thing. You know, What if we lose that? How are we going to contact people if we don't have a Facebook? Or we're going to go back to the way we were, where we didn't have contact with people. I think sometimes, though, having too much contact is not good for us. And, and being... Uh, voluntarily revealing things about us is not something we want to do. I think everybody thinks this makes me sort of a pseudo-celebrity. You know, there's some things you don't want people to know about. Right, it's right. like I always tell people, it's like when I used to go out with go out with people before I got married, I'd always say this. I said, the Clyde you're seeing is Clyde when he's on, but are you going to be able to handle Clyde backstage? That's another story. Yeah, meaning you're going to handle the guy who takes his shoes off, his feet might stink, or he might smell sweaty, or he's going to fart in bed, or whatever. Are you going to be able to handle that? And that's the whole point. We, we see people one way, but then when we get to know them, it's like you don't want to you don't want to have your friends live with you. The illusion right. wears There's, off. We all put on an illusion, but then we we realize that we are stinking, bleeding human beings, and a lot of people don't want to handle that. It's like when you when I was like uh, looking for someone to fall in love with and be with, I always said it's got to be wheelchair love. And that's what's wheelchair love. Got to be willing to push your, push you through an amusement park in a wheelchair and not get annoyed. And I think people need to start thinking about that. They that's, need to think about when they're in love with somebody, would I be willing to go through it with them if warts and all showed up, if they just all of a sudden woke up and they're all covered in warts or whatever. And I think that's the problem. We're so superficial and we're so immediate and so wanting things now, 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 now that we don't think about the things need to grow. They need to take time. It's not a sprint. It's a journey. Let's journey. Let's have the journey. Let's not sprint all the time. Let's not always be right. Let's not always be wrong. Let's not always, I have the answer. You don't. You're just like everybody else. You're seeking. It's like you were saying about belief. It's, it's not just believing something. It's in search of a belief. You know, I was religious for a long time. I I practiced religion, I got real good at it, and I retired because I realized that I could only go so far with religion, and I became who I was, or I am now. And um, I'm very grateful for my uh, religious learnings and the things I learned through religion, but I'm also very grateful for all the things I've learned outside of that. All of the esoteric knowledge and all of the other things that I just basically swallowed up like a sponge. I have recall, and that's my, uh, my superpower. And I'm grateful for that. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, Clyde, you know, it's always great to talk to you. It's a tremendous honor to have you here and spend some time. And just to follow up with what you were saying um, in terms of AI and aliens, you know, through the late work of Nigel Kerner, you know, he was a colleague of mine and we bounced ideas off of each other. And some of what we talked about, he turned into a book. And he believes that this whole transhumanist agenda with AI, it's a work of E.T., I do too. I, I'm learning that because, I mean, I was, again, referring back to some research I did. Uh, back in the 1920s, there was a movie called Algol, Tragedy and Power. It was one of the first science fiction movies ever made. It was about an alien that comes down from Algol, which is the winking, they call it the blinking demon star. He came down and gave this guy who was a coal miner uh, a technology that said, Forever energy, forever cure people, forever this, everything that we think the aliens are going to give us anyway. But it turned out it was not good for him. And it turned out it basically ruined his life. But what was really funny is is that Algol 60 
was the name of the first algorithmic oh, computer. Yeah. Wow. And then Algo 58, Algo 60, Algo 61. And it was the algorithm growing and growing and growing. And now I believe that algorithms are certainly, I don't know if you call them a gift or a curse, yes. from the aliens because it's like having a demon and an angel sitting on your shoulder making choices for you on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that the reason why we're all screwed up and we're all like valuing these crazy ideas or we're being told that we're all racist or being told that we're all hateful is because it's the computers telling us we are. Right. And we're not. And the computers are telling the media, oh, you know, everybody's racist, everybody's... Because they, the thing about computers, and if you've noticed all of these, you know, what they call um, SOCIs, S-O-C-I, it's uh, a, a social organized uh, intelligence. Uh, it is what I think QAnon was. QAnon was like, it was, it was like a social organized intelligence um, that uh, basically had people thinking and hearing things and believing them. And a lot of it was outrageous. Almost like a random number generator. Right. And, and what it is is it says, hey, they like these stories. I'll keep giving them stories in their little echo chamber. They're going to believe them. ChatGPT does that now. Hey, good point. Why, why, why are we thinking that maybe QAnon was ChatGPT? That's a good, yeah. And, and how it basically exemplified all of the horrible things that you could even think of, from all the Hollywood personalities being pedophiles yeah. to them drinking adrenochrome blood and all these people believing this stuff, but they had no proof. But they believed a computer program, a SOCI, you know, uh, organized cooperative intelligence. You know, it's almost sentient in a way. Knowing what uh, they, the people want to hear. It's like the, the blockchain. We always hear this blockchain. Blockchain is this invisible ledger that keeps all of the records of our money exchanges, right? So what, this, what the blockchain did one time, it's the closest thing we got to singularity, and I'll tell you why. The blockchain one day woke up and said, you know, I want to get bigger. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create money out of thin air that people are going to invest in. It's called Bitcoin. And people are gonna learn that I will give them money if they continue to build on me. So here we have the ledger known as the blockchain feeding people with the idea that they're gonna get money out of nothing. People are getting money out of nothing, just like they do with the dollar, but it's not, it's not helping a government. It's helping the internet grow. It's helping exchange happen without the government. That's why it really bothers me when people say, well, Bitcoin's bad. No, it's good because you don't have to deal with the government looking into what you're buying and selling. But now the government's getting smart and thinking, okay, now we're gonna have a cashless society and we're gonna monitor the money. But not only can they monitor the money and monitor what you do, they can always put a, an expiration date on the money you can use. By the way, you need to use all this money by this date, you say. And no longer gold is the hot commodity. It's right. now data. But it will be. Gold will be data. Gold will be a hot commodity. It's because when everything falls apart, people have always put worth on gold. And you can either buy a house with a coin or whatever because people want precious metals. It's just something that hasn't lost its worth. And so that's why, I don't know, we got to realize that everything that we think we know, we won't know. We're just going to go back to crawling again and not walking and and it's, I don't know if I'm ready for that. I don't know if I'm ready for that either. And again, you know, we are a small pool of individuals, a small demographic, the larger majority out there. They're still, you know, like you were saying earlier, all they care about is going home on time to watch their favorite show yeah. and have their you know, favorite TV dinner and meal. Exactly. And, you know, those are the people that walk around with the lights on but no one's home syndrome, as I like well, to say. Well, you know, that's right. Take my urban sprawl away from me, take away my beer, take away my football games, and then I'll start feeling the pinch. I think that's the thing. I mean, even in the United States, at our worst, we're, we're basically taken care of. Right. And, you know, we are a society that's basically, you know, we're addicted to barbiturates laced with apathy. Right. So we forget about all this shit. I just got word that I... Uh, yeah, we're going to wrap it up here, okay. no doubt. And Clyde, once again, thank you for sharing some of your time with us. And again, hey, if you ever need to sit out, I'm ready to get in there whenever you need me. I well, appreciate that. Thank yeah, I'll yeah, jump we'll in there. looking for people. I'm sure uh, people, we have a network we're working on. And I think that that will, uh, I think that might be beneficial for you. We're going to include a lot of people that we really respect. You got it, brother. You know, I would appreciate love to that. be a part of that and help you out as any, any way I can. And once again, thank you.